Right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning and thank you for coming out today. Um, I'm Sarah Mills, I'm a postdoctoral fellow and uh, lecturer in the Center for Local, State and Urban Policy here at the Ford School. Um, Center for Local, State and Urban Policy, Close Up is one of our research centers here. And this event is actually part of our Close Up in the Classroom initiative. Um, that is a project um, that's funded by the provost office third century initiative to help us better integrate the research that's going on in our center with um, what's happening in the classroom here. And so uh, as part of that grant, we were able to develop two different courses. This is a course on environmental policy research. And so um, it really links up with close ups efforts in um, we have an environmental uh, energy and environmental policy initiative. Um, and so many of the students in the class are engaging with that data and others are doing work uh, through the class that's uh, directly applicable to this type of stuff that we're doing in the center. In addition to close up sponsoring this, um, it's also being co-sponsored by the program in the environment, the School of Natural Resources and Environment, and the Energy Institute. So I want to thank those partners. And she slipped out of the room, but I also wanted to thank Bonnie Roberts, uh, my colleague at Close Up for pulling ever, all of the details together for this. Uh, because this is part of the class, there are, as I said, a number of um, students from that particular class here. And um, pedagogically, what I really wanted to present them with was the nuts and bolts of research. How do you pull together a policy research process? And while I was in DC um, for a conference last year, I met Reardon Frost, and he was um, telling me about this project and really ma making pragmatic decisions on what, um, what categories do you include if you're trying to measure the states against each other in terms of their level of environmental policy. Um, and so that's really what I um, hope that we'll be able to get out of this an, an introduction generally to his environmental index. Um, Reardon is finishing up his PhD in public administration at American. Hopefully it'll be done by the end of the year. Um, in addition to this work, he's also, um, his dissertation is also looking at urban sustainability um, and urban policy. And I understand he's a blogger on uh, urban policy and planning um, specifically in DC. So I look forward to your presentation. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you uh, to Barry and uh, Bonnie as well for hosting me. Um, this is a project that I'm working on with the Center for Environmental Policy at American University, which is within the Department of Public Administration and Policy there. Um, and as, as Sarah mentioned, this is, it's really about trying to create a, a modern state environmental index. And I'm going to go over both the results from that index, but also how we're trying to construct that index, the challenges uh, that are inherent in constructing an index. So just to justify why we're doing what we're doing off the bat, uh, we're focusing on the state level. Uh, William K. Riley, not to be confused with Bill O'Reilly, um, is the former administ uh, EPA administrator under George H.W. Bush. He's uh, kind of our Center for Environmental Policy's figurehead. And he gave a speech to the Environmental Council of the States back in 2015 in which he said climate action and adaptation has been most notable and imaginative at the state and local levels, and if the clean power rule is overturned, it will continue to be. So he said this about a year before the 2016 election, and the clean power rule now is, I would say, on even shakier ground. So um, the state and local levels are really going to be, I think, the new focus for these types of policies, um, especially as they are either ignored or worked against on uh, the federal level. So if we agree on, on the state level then, uh, why create a ranking? I understand that um, the students in this class will be creating somewhat similar things, but not necessarily uh, exactly like this. But um, we wanted to do a ranking because it's great for benchmarking. You can see the progress that you've made or lost, especially over the years. You can see if you're you know, in the leading uh, states or if you're at the bottom of the ranking, room for improvement. You can compare yourself to your neighbors. Uh, everybody loves to do that. Um, and then also, everybody loves and hates rankings. I put a logo of uh, US News and World Report college ranking. I went to undergrad at Connecticut College, and when I was there, they signed on to 
a list of colleges that were boycotting the US News and World Report uh, college ranking because they felt as though the methodology was unfair or maybe not transparent enough, uh, whatever. And I'm sure it probably had nothing to do with the fact that you know, we slipped rankings or something that year. But um, the fact of the matter is, and as, as I'll get into later, rankings really can rile people up as, as to, um, you know, we're really proud that we're at the top. We're really mad that we're at the bottom. Why did you have this methodology this way? So that's what I'm going to uh, explore. So when it comes to environmental rankings, there's quite a few on the national level. This is Yale University's Environmental Performance Index. They've been producing this for a while. Uh, these are the 2016 results uh, of environmental performance, blue being good, red being bad. Um, basically, it looks like a developed country, developing country map. Um, but this is just to, to show that you know, there's, there's a lot of work being done here on the national level. On the city level, there's a lot of work being done as well. Kent Portney's Taking Sustainable Cities Seriously is a great look at it. Uh, so there's an organization called Sustain Lane that was ranking cities in the US. Uh, there's a lot of global city rankings, for instance, from Arcadis here. Uh, but on the state level, the most recent one that we could find was the financial services blog Wallet Hub, for some reason, has decided to rank the states on environmental uh, policy and performance. But the most recent comprehensive ranking that we could find is the 1991 to 1992 Green Index, uh, which was the Institute for um, Southern Studies, I believe, Bob Hall and Mary Lee Kerr, um, and uh, had about 256 indicators in it, and was somewhat surprisingly to us um, one of the most recent we could find. So 1991 to 1992 is quite old when it comes to data, not when it comes to people, but when it comes to data, it's, it's very, very old. And so scholars have been looking at what have people been using in lieu of a good modern index. So uh, Kaniski and Woods in 2012 wrote an article that categorized what environmental scholars have been using uh, since then because there haven't really been any good ones since then. So they have it in four categories, state government expenditures on environmental protection, private sector pollution abatement, state environmental regulatory enforcements, and then of course environmental indices. And the funny thing is that some people as recently as 2009, including the scholars who wrote this very article, um, have been using the 1991 to 1992 Green Index, even though it's almost, uh, you know, as of, as of 2009, 20 years old. So what has uh, happened since then in terms of indices is uh, one that appeared in Forbes in 2007. It didn't really have its own dedicated website or anything. It was just kind of a, an article that appeared on it. Uh, America's Green Estates, there were six indicators uh, listed there. Uh, carbon footprint, air, water, et cetera. Uh, the states that led in that ranking were Vermont, Oregon, and Washington. The states that were at the bottom, Alabama, Indiana, West Virginia. And then more recently, as I mentioned, the financial services blog Wallet Hub, um, which gives you credit scores and, and other things, has decided to uh, rank the states. And um, uh, surprisingly in depth, actually, as well, with three categories with 17 indicators total. Uh, five in environmental quality, eight in eco-friendly behaviors, and four in climate change contributions. The states that lead up on there are Vermont, Washington, and Massachusetts, and the states that are at the bottom, Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming. So we set out at the Center for Environmental Policy to create a new, uh, modern, comprehensive state policy index. And so we were trying to mirror the 1991 to 1992 Green Index, which, as I mentioned, has 256 indicators, 179 condition indicators, and 77 policy indicators. So that seems like a very high bar, but the fact of the matter is that some, and it is a fairly high bar, but some of their variables were somewhat questionable. For instance, they had things like, what percent of your state is federal land? That's not really anything the state has any control over, necessarily. Uh, what percent of your state is forest land? Some states are more forested than, than others. You know, the, the climate, the geography is, is vastly different across the country. Um, you know, you, you could argue that you should punish more agricultural states that have torn down their forests or urbanized states that have torn down, but you know, then there's also states that are more deserted in general. 
So, you know, there's, there's just some, some interesting things that you could take issue with. Um, the number of motorboats was the one that I thought was most peculiar. It was in their um, kind of uh, fun and lifestyle uh, part of their index where they're trying to see how, um, how much uh, leisure, how, how good the leisure and recreation is in a state. But, you know, I'm from Minnesota and there's going to be a lot more motorboats in the land of 10,000 lakes than there are in, uh, say, Nevada. So, um, some double counting as well um, that, they were, that they were using in their methodology so it wasn't as rigorous as it could be. Uh, and then the biggest problem though that I would say is that replicability is very difficult with this index. So if I wanted to just look and say, okay, I just wanna make a 2016, 2017 green index, I'll use all their same indicators, I actually can't do that because a lot of their indicators were publicly available government data, but a lot of their indicators were other indices made by other organizations. And the big problem with that is that those organizations stop making those indices. And so if I wanted to replicate it, then I have to go you know, to the World Wildlife Fund, say, hey, remember back in you know, 1990 when you made this index, can we make it again? Uh, you know, so it, it quickly becomes um, an unmanageable task. So when we set out to create our index, we were looking both at policies and conditions. So policies are the things uh, that you know, the state legislatures pass, um, they funding conservation, water nutrient standards, uh, carbon cap and trade, like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast. Uh, and then conditions are, are kind of the results, we would say, of those policies, um, and also of things that uh, the policies haven't yet addressed, but carbon emissions, energy consumption, uh, so on and so forth. So we started looking at collecting in both of those. And our guiding principles were, especially for conditions, uh, to normalize the data to be able to compare states to one another because otherwise comparing you know, Rhode Island and California doesn't make a lot of sense. So the most common ways of normalizing that is, is by GDP or by population. Um, we, we chose to do it by GDP because it answers the question, you know, how much uh, air pollution do you need to emit to generate a million dollars of GDP? And that's what we, we like to call uh, ecological efficiency. Um, but it actually has pretty similar results when you do it by population as well, which I'll show you. Um, we also wanted to collect data from publicly available sources that were very easily accessible, very transparent, very replicable. So we're just looking for kind of like off the shelf data from the Department of Transportation, the EPA, the Department of Energy. We're not really looking for anything where, you know, you would need if you wanted to replicate it to like go to every state and say, hey, you know, what is your data on this specific thing? And that's a problem when it comes to uh, the policy variables. So, uh, you know, where a lot of those policy variables in order to see which states have these policies, you need to go to each state's, you know, legislature website, so on and so forth. So what we decided to focus on first was the conditions, the ecological efficiency side normalized uh, by GDP to compare. And we came up with eight to nine indicators um, in these different categories. So in energy and climate, we have carbon dioxide emissions. We get that from the Energy Information Administration. Uh, energy consumption from the same source. Air, we have criteria air pollutants. Criteria air pollutants are six air pollutants that the Clean Air Act requires the EPA to regulate. Uh, and so we have those, which is from the EPA. Um, transportation vehicle miles traveled, which is from the Department of Transportation. That's kind of a proxy variable to get at the numerous effects of the transportation sector um, from you know, the, the carbon emissions from it, air pollution from it, uh, runoff from it as well. Um, and then in the water category, uh, again, kind of proxy variables. Fertilizer purchased, we were trying to get it runoff from that, some nutrients from that. Um, water withdrawals, surface or ground, we can split that into two variables, which is why this is eight or nine indicators. Um, and then in the waste variable, we have toxic release inventory and uh, hazardous waste generation. And these variables aren't perfect, and I'll talk about that uh, as well, uh, how we got quite a bit of feedback on these variables. Uh, but these are the results here from uh, the index, including all those variables that were just listed. And as you can see, um, just so that you can actually read it, I just put the, the top eight and the bottom eight here. But uh, the top eight are mostly small northeastern states, um, and the bottom eight are a little more geographically spread out, but 
uh, in general, more um, resource extractive states or um, uh, fossil fuel dependent states uh, a little less developed um, than, these, than the kind of small northeastern states in terms of urbanization. Um, so, and then this is also showing you uh, per GSP just means gross state product, so same thing as GDP. Um, but comparing that uh, with population, and you're seeing that you're, you're basically within one to three ranks uh, on either uh, per GDP or, or per capita. So the challenges that we experienced with this particular index were data availability and data quality. Since we were looking for things that were right off the shelf, uh, easily available, uh, data availability was a big problem. And it was basically a big problem in anything except for energy. There's great data in energy. If you're doing a project on energy, congratulations, it's going to be much easier than, for instance, water. If you're going to do a project on water, reconsider. Um, because uh, water is, is just uh, in, in a very interesting thing that there is not very available, and the data quality itself is not high. Um, and additionally, sometimes you'll just have to use variables that are proxy variables. So vehicle miles traveled, as I mentioned, is a proxy variable. It's not directly measuring what you're interested in, but it gets at it um, uh, through, you know, just saying this is the vehicle miles, and then that's associated with uh, the different effects of the transportation sector. But uh, data quality, as I mentioned with water, one of the things that we were considering for a policy indicator was uh, you know, what percent of your waters in a state have you assessed? And we thought, okay, maybe that would be a good proxy variable for how good of a handle do you have on your water quality? How committed are you to um, addressing your water quality? And what we noticed in that a data set, which is reported to the EPA, is that some states would say, oh, how much percent of our water bodies have we assessed? 120, of course. Uh, 119%. And that is impossible. So um, we asked the EPA about it, and they basically just kind of shrugged and said, you know, if, if we send it back to the states and say, no, do it again, we get a call from a congressperson that says, hey, stop bothering my state. So um, we just kind of tossed that variable out the door. Um, surface water withdrawals is another thing that has data quality issues um, because surface water withdrawals we are trying to use as a uh, proxy for like water use in a state. And for one, there's the issue of some states are gonna depend more on their surface water, some states are gonna depend more on their groundwater, but surface water withdrawals also includes water that is being drawn up into hydropower dams, despite the fact that it's then being put right back. So, you know, I, we don't really wanna punish states for using hydropower in, in that variable. So, that's, uh, that's an issue that we ran into as well. There's also the issue of extreme outliers. One of the most important things you can do in projects like this is really kind of delve into your data and see what's happening in terms of the range, the outliers, et cetera. And one of the things that we noticed that is that Alaska, for instance, was a crazy high outlier on toxic release inventory. So uh, number one on toxic release inventory is Vermont releases about 271,000 pounds a year of toxic releases. And Alaska, on the other hand, is at 970 million. And Alaska is also much higher than anyone in you know, 49th or 48th place as well. And we don't really know why this is. We have, we've hypothesized that it could be because of the mining operations in Alaska. It could be that injection wells and so on are, uh, you know, that's included in toxic releases. So, you know, it's, it's unclear, but this is something that we've seen in the data, and it troubles us because we're not sure if it's a reporting error or if it's just something that maybe we don't want measured. And when it comes to things that we don't want measured, we also notice that in carbon intensity, there were places like Alaska that had very high carbon emissions, much, much higher than anybody else, even when we're, you know, controlling for GDP. And I noticed when I delved into the data that the miscellaneous tier had a lot of the carbon emissions. So I emailed the EPA, and that's another piece of advice, is that you know, emailing uh, these agencies directly and just asking them can be very helpful. And one of the things that the EPA told me was, oh yeah, in some of the earlier years, um, you know, like, besides our most recent data, we are including uh, emissions from forest fires in your carbon emissions. And that's not really something 
you know, that I want to punish a state for, you know, because it's not from their direct industry, um, and it's not necessarily something that they have control over. So those are two issues that we had. And then uh, eco-efficiency uh, index, the feedback that we got, um, people critiqued the appropriateness of the variables, including like the fertilizer variable, water withdrawals, um, proxy variables people sometimes take issue with. Um, and uh, we also had some critiques about the fairness of comparisons. We presented this index to the Environmental Council of the States, which is an organization of all of the heads of the environment departments uh, in all the different states. They were gathered in DC because they were actually considering making their own ranking. And one of the things that uh, a representative from North Carolina told me was, you know, I would be comfortable being compared to Tennessee. I'm not comfortable with being compared to New York State. So that's another thing that you can do is you can, you can do a nationwide comparison like we've been doing um, in this project, or you, know, you can kind of break things out by region to see more specifically how people are doing against their neighbors. Uh, people also critiqued how it was kind of unfair against certain economic industries. You know, you've got small northeastern states that have a lot of financial services, which don't have a lot of direct uh, environmental impact. And then you have other states like North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana that are all more <laughs> dependent on natural resource extraction. And this was kind of punishing them. Uh, it was also pointed out to us that fossil fuel dependent states do poorly in this index, but you know, that's actually pretty intentional because if you're a fossil fuel dependent state, uh, then I think that you shouldn't do well in an environmental index. So additionally, people wanted us to show performance beyond rankings uh, because rankings don't tell you as much. So that's one of the things we changed first is that you know, rankings are great. You can say, great, I got first place, I got second place, whatever. But it's impossible to tell, you know, what's the distance between 22nd and 23rd place. Um, it could be very, very close, or it could be, you know, a wide chasm that, that is there. So what we decided to do was start assigning state scores. And this is something that a lot of indices and rankings and everything, like a lot of places assign scores, but people are like strangely proprietary about their score formulas. Um, you know, they say, oh, we based on this, this, and this, but they never show you the actual calculation. So since transparency and replicability was important to us, uh, we came up with a very, very simple formula uh, that I'll show you on the next slide. But, you know, this is an interesting thing as well because there are more decisions to make here. Do you base it on the average? Do you base it on the median? Do you base it on the standard deviation? Uh, when you base it on the average, it's susceptible to outliers. The median, to a certain extent, is also susceptible to outliers if there's enough outliers to bring it up. Standard deviation is something that was suggested to us at uh, APAM, the uh, policy conference, uh, when we presented this there in, in the fall. And so we actually then ended up using that because standard deviation is based on the total distribution of uh, the state's performance. And so it's not as susceptible to outliers um, and it works a little better for us, we found. The other thing that we did with the feedback is we saw that you know, there, was, there was definitely issues uh, with the appropriateness, with data quality on several of the variables, like the toxic release inventory one or the water withdrawals. So we decided to focus on a sub-index and really focus on the variables that had the highest quality data, that had the most favorable feedback on them, and they were also thematically linked. So we created something called the Air, Climate, and Energy uh, Sub-Index, which we'll just call the ACE Index. Uh, and that has energy efficiency, carbon intensity, vehicle miles traveled, and criteria air pollutants. So things that are all connected to uh, air, climate, and energy. And uh, things that we also had the most confidence in. As I mentioned with energy, uh, a lot of confidence in their data quality and data availability. Um, and that's uh, two of the four variables here. So, our scoring formula, uh, as I mentioned, it's based on standard deviation. It's super simple. I don't even have, you know, any, any Greek on the board. Uh, it's basically just standard deviation divided by performance times 10 so that you can read it a little easier is the times 10. <coughs> but, and then we weighted everything in the ACE index except for the vehicle miles traveled variable and our um, justification for that was that vehicle miles traveled is more of a proxy variable. The other ones are more direct measurement variables. So we weighted uh, vehicle miles traveled a little less. Uh, so the advantage of this is that, you know, the magnitude of between the states is revealed. The rankings um, don't tell you that, but the scores do. Uh, the results are comparable across indicators because the performance and the standard deviation are both 
within that measurement, but then they produce a score that you can compare you know, across energy efficiency and carbon intensity. So then, um, just as an example of how simple this formula is and how it works, uh, Michigan consumed about 2,000 megawatt hours per million dollars GDP in 2013, and Alabama, which was you know, just the, the first state in the alphabet, uh, consumed about 3,000 megawatt hours per million dollars GDP. So the standard deviation is about 806 for energy efficiency, for energy consumption. Um, and then you see the results from that. The higher the score, the better you are. So very easy to understand, pretty simple, based on standard deviation, not as susceptible to outliers. Um, so you know, it's, uh, you could do more complicated things that might give you um, more interesting results, but we really wanted to kind of keep it simple and, uh, and have something that was easily understandable. So now we, we are closer to the results, uh, which, is, um, which is something that people always, always like to see. And uh, when it comes to results, there's a lot of different ways to display your results. So obviously there's tables, the classic way, but as you saw earlier, I'm only really showing the top eight and the bottom eight of, uh, of the states in these tables. And so, you know, you can't show like all 50 states to an to a, uh, audience like this. So then there's maps, uh, great for comparing the states, but less specific information known on that. Um, radar charts, I'll, I'll show you one of those for Michigan, which kind of shows within state performance. Uh, and then scatter plots as well can show you uh, good trends. So on the ACE index, again, this is just the four variables, carbon intensity, energy efficiency, uh, vehicle miles traveled, and criteria air pollutants. Uh, these are the results. So the results of the scores uh, and the rankings there. So top eight again, mostly small northeastern states, but we also have California now, which was not even in the top eight on the eco-efficiency index, is, um, is second here. Um, we have scores that range up to 47 and down to two. On the bottom, we have uh, Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming, more natural resource intensive states, as well as Alaska. Um, Mississippi is not dead last, so they would be happy to see that. Uh, but, uh, but still in the bottom eight there, and um, some other states there as well. So this is uh, then showing, again, per GDP versus per capita uh, for the ACE index, not the eco-efficiency index, which I showed earlier. And uh, as you can see, it's really pretty similar across the board. There is one um, bigger difference that I'll point out with Mississippi. They have, I think, a below average um, GDP, so they do a little worse in the uh, GDP and a little better in the population, moving from 46 to uh, 39th place in that, in that particular ranking. So this is what I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the different ways that you can do your scoring formulas. So on the left I have uh, standard deviation, which is what I just showed, uh, top four and bottom four here. And these are the scores that are produced when you base it on standard deviation. These are the scores in the middle that are produced when you base it on average and the rankings. The top four are the same there um, with three and four switched. Uh, so New York moves up. Uh, and then the bottom four are almost the same, except Alaska does a lot better. And this also you see in the median. The top four stay the same. Bottom four, you know, Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming holding down the fort uh, across the board, same rankings. But uh, Alaska moves to 38th place and 40th place when you base it on average and median. And I'm thinking that that's because Alaska's benefiting when they're skewing up the average or the median because then it's a higher, um, it's, it's closer to them. When, uh, the average and median are both closer to them when they're doing that, when they're uh, biasing it upwards. Whereas standard deviation, it's, it's uh, less susceptible to that. So, Everybody loves maps. I say that because I love maps. I'm not sure it's actually true. But um, there's a bunch of maps that I can now show. And this is the overall ACE index. So we have, again, the variables on the right. For anyone who's interested, criteria air pollutants, the, uh, the six are ozone, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide. And lead is actually a uh, criteria air pollutant. but um, since the successful legislation in the 90s, um, since 2005, lead has been so negligible that it's been hardly reported, which is 
really good news. So um, this is what you see. Darker green is better. Um, gold is, uh, is worse. And this is, this is something that, you know, you don't think that colors on a map is necessarily going to make that much of a difference. But one of the most common feedbacks that we got was that was, you know, be nice to the states that aren't doing well. So at one point in time, I listed uh, the bottom states as something like, you know, middling performance or something. And I got quite an earful for that. Uh, so now, you know, we don't use green and red, you know, or anything like that. It's, you know, you're just kind of a yellowish color if you're not, if, you're, if you have room for improvement. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something that I, I did not think uh, I would run into, but it's, it's definitely a, a, a useful thing to keep in mind. Um, so again, you, you have here uh, the overall results, and uh, then you can specify this to, uh, to each variable. So I used a, a free mapping application use, uh, called Tableau Public. Um, I highly recommend it, and it, I can, you can make these great maps pretty easily. Um, carbon intensity, you have a pretty similar uh, to your last slide, but there's a couple states uh, like Idaho doing better than usual because they've got their hydropower, uh, that's what we think, um, and then the northeastern states doing well and everything. And um, one of the reasons that we're making this ranking, this index, is so that researchers will look, will look at these maps and look at these results and say, oh, like, I wonder why this state is doing well or poorly or whatever. I wonder why uh, these results are the way they are. And that's something that the index can then, you know, motivate is further research on these things. That's one of the reasons that we wanted to create it is that uh, researchers would be able to use it, you know, as, as an indicator of their own if they want, or to just get into the reasons for these uh, different levels of performance. So criteria air pollutants is a little more interesting. Um, there's outliers on the other side in criteria air pollutants. So there's, there's people who, or states rather, who are doing uh, really, really well on criteria air pollutants, and then other states that are just doing you know, pretty well. So you know, middle of the country in general is a little lower on these rankings, northeast and, uh, and, and west doing a lot better. And again, those are all the um, uh, criteria air pollutants that are included here. So then energy efficiency states in general uh, do better on this one. Um, but again, you're seeing the same pattern of the Northeast and the West Coast. But then you also have some states like North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Georgia, Florida um, that might be doing a little better than you might expect. North Carolina in general actually in this index does better than you expect. Um, and uh, a little bit in the, the Midwest there as well. And then vehicle miles traveled. Um, you'll notice that Alaska on all of these was uh, doing poorly. Alaska's number one in the country for vehicle miles traveled uh, per GDP. And the reason, I think, that this is, is because there aren't many roads in Alaska. Um, Intercity travel in Alaska is largely done by, you know, ferry and by plane. And so it's not like a place like, for instance, in Montana, where if you want to get to anywhere else in Montana, you're going to be driving long stretches. Um, so, you know, that's what we're thinking, but, you know, it could be easily interesting to, to get more into that. Same thing with Hawaii. Um, but you see a lot of the kind of, you know, southeastern states, more, more driving dependent states not doing as well on that. Um, and the thing, too, that I should mention is that, you know, some people have registered surprise, for instance, that Texas is doing uh, better on this variable. And there is a little bit of uh, bias given to states that have uh, very high GDPs, since we're controlling by GDP. Um, Texas has very high GDP, as does California. So in general, you know, they have more room to um, have, like, higher vehicle miles traveled, for instance, um, because of their very high GDP. So uh, specifics on Michigan. Um, we have the, uh, they're basically, Michigan's basically in the, the middle of the pack, uh, but a little better than 25th place on, on most of these variables. These are its scores. Um, again, the ACE index is with weighting, so that's why it's, uh, you know, not bigger than the sum of the others. Um, but 23rd in ACE index, 28th in carbon intensity, 31st in vehicle miles traveled, 22nd in criteria air pollutants, 26th in energy efficiency. So uh, this is, on the left, an example of a radar chart. And this is something that, in our experience with, our, with the feedback that we've received, 
uh, states like a little more because they can see where they're doing better or where they're doing worse. But basically, as I mentioned before with the scores, higher scores are better. And uh, what you can see here is, you know, like if higher scores are better, then a bigger shape is better. And Michigan's doing pretty well on criteria air pollutants, um, not as well on vehicle miles traveled, a little better on uh, carbon intensity and energy efficiency. Um, and, you know, Michigan and Ohio, I wanted to compare. Um, and uh, I don't want to get kicked out for this or anything, but um, they're neck and neck. Uh, and uh, Ohio may be better in, uh, in some areas, but, uh, but you know, they're, I, they're, for the most part, across the rankings, they're you know, one rank away, usually. But this is just another way, too, of showing uh, this is just stacking the scores of all the variables on top of each other, which you can do because the um, scores are comparable across, uh, across indicators. And, um, and so then you can just kind of see uh, how that looks. And when you know, the states are slightly more different, you know, for instance, Alabama and Michigan, you can see the difference better. But this basically looks like the, the same two bars there. So another thing that you can do is you can start to look at uh, variable correlations. And so you know, this is something that I, I just plugged into uh, Stata. Uh, but you could probably also do this in Excel. But it's just seeing. Um, how much these variables are correlated, how much they move together and everything. And so, as you can see, vehicle miles traveled, um, criteria air pollutants across the board, you know, we're always higher than 0.5. These are like pretty strong uh, correlations. Energy efficiency and carbon intensity are very highly correlated at 0.93. And that's actually a bit of a concern. We like to see some level of correlation with all of these variables. Um, you know, Dan Fiorino, who heads the Center for Environmental Policy, uh, makes, uses this to make the argument that you know, when you improve one thing, you're improving these other things across the board. Um, but one of the concerns is that carbon intensity and energy efficiency are so strongly correlated that we might be double counting a little bit there um, because you know, energy related to uh, carbon emissions. And so that would be a concern that uh, you know, we could kind of explore more. So one of the other things that we can explore more is what are the reasons for the variations in state performance? So this is just, again, the overall ACE index map. But you know, why is it that West Virginia is not doing well or Montana is doing, not doing well? And as I mentioned, this is the type of thing we want our, uh, our index to motivate research on. Uh, but we can come up with our own hypotheses as well. Uh, so a few listed here, natural resource extraction I mentioned, fossil fuels I mentioned. Um, but two interesting things that, uh, that I want to mention as well is that there's what's called a race to the bottom among states. And that's something where states will race with each other to cut their environmental regulations to attract businesses to their state. Um, uh, Vogel, the scholar, called this the Delaware effect, not because of Delaware's environmental regulations, but they basically used like, their tax regulations and, and cutting those to uh, attract more corporations to their state. Um, and so that's something that's studied a lot, and studied a lot especially with southeastern states um, that are trying to create business-friendly environments um, by cutting a lot of those regulations and making it really cheap to set up there. Um, but there's also a thing called race to the top. And that's where states that are already dark green are basically trying to race to be the best in all you know, the environmental rankings and everything. California comes out with a policy, and other states are trying to come out with similar policies, because there are also you know, not only businesses, but residents that are looking to uh, locate in states uh, with good environmental policies. And then there's also the fact that occasionally, the feds will come in and say, we want to create a new policy. We're going to base it on, for instance, California's policy. And so that's a bit of a race to the top, because then California's very stringent policy brings everyone else up as well. So, you know, or it could be, you know, as much as we're conjecturing about all these other things, maybe it's just uh, red states are not as good and blue states are better. Um, or maybe, you know, it's a, it's a policy thing. So we'll get into some of that here. So uh, natural resource extractive industries, unsurprisingly, the top three states on the ACE index have less than 1% of their GDP and their employment in the extractive industry. Uh, and then the bottom three states have much more than that, uh, with Wyoming having the most. 22% uh, of its uh, GSP is from the extractive industry. 
This is all from the U.S. Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which is led by the uh, U.S. Interior Department. Um, these numbers, though, were still kind of surprisingly low on the, on the bottom three um, in, in terms of like percent of employment especially. Um, but this is just an interesting thing that you can see, you know, maybe that's the reason that Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming are always uh, 48, 49, and 50. <coughs> so it could be a policy thing. So one of the things that we did is instead of including other indices within our own index is that we can just compare our index to theirs. So our ACE index is based, again, on, on performance, on conditions. Um, so it's like the, the conditions that are actually occurring. Whereas uh, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy has created a whole index on the policies that each state has passed, specifically relating to energy. And when we compare our index on the uh, bottom there and the ACEEE index, it's a pretty up and down positive correlation. Uh, correlation score specifically of uh, 0.67. And this is something that you know, we, we can use to kind of confirm all results. This looks right. Uh, our air, climate, and energy index is matching up pretty well with an energy policy index. Um, and so this is something that you know, if we wanted to, then we could get into it even further with regressions and trying to see uh, how strong that, that relationship holds up. So red states and blue states and those in between we noticed that um, we saw this article uh, by Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson in the New York Times in uh, July of 2016, a couple months before the election, and they color-coded the states on a zero through four scale based on how many times that they had voted Democratic in the past four presidential elections. So again, this is before the 2016 presidential election. Um, so the past four presidential elections, you get dark blue, if you went Democrat all four times, you get light blue if it's three times, purple if it's twice, light red if it's once, and then dark red if you didn't vote Democrat at all in the past four elections. So then they put this and, and ranked the states on a variety of different um, indicators. So we have like on the right, that's education, we've got on the left income, uh, innovation, life expectancy, so on and so forth. And the point they were making is that you know, the blue states are pretty much at the top and the red states are pretty much at the bottom of these rankings. So we shamelessly stole this and um, gave them you know, credit for it and everything. But this is what it looks like with our indicators. And so to compare that, I would argue that it's even more strongly divided with blue states on the top and red states on the bottom. And I updated the, um, the color code to include the 2016 and exclude the uh, 2000 elections, so the past four elections, which actually turned more states blue than red because of what happened in 2000. Um, but this is the result of that, and uh, the, it's probably hard to read, but this is carbon intensity, vehicle miles traveled, criteria air pollutants, energy efficiency, and the overall index all the way on the right. And uh, as you can see with vehicle miles traveled, Alaska up there, the, uh, you know, kind of the only, Alaska and Texas actually, only deep red in the, at the very top of the rankings there. So I also did a simple correlation with this, so carbon intensity and um, all, of, all of my variables with that color-coded variable, just the zero through four variable. And uh, this is what I found, um, pretty strong correlations across the board. The overall index is almost 70% there. Um, energy efficiency and carbon intensity very high as well. So, in conclusion, uh, my advice, especially for the students in the room, um, but for anybody who's, who's you know, looking at these index indices or wants to create their own indices, um, seek out feedback and listen to it. Uh, it can definitely be harsh, but it's, it's really very useful. And, um, you know, I've, I've often said, you know, with these types of projects and with life in general, never take yourself too seriously. Uh, you know, if someone says, uh, you know, I'm not really a fan of that particular way of ranking it, uh, you know, it's like, okay, maybe they're right. You know, maybe it's not an insult to your character type of thing. So, um, so you know, it's just, it's, it's a really interesting thing and, and anybody can give you feedback on these types of things because everyone has kind of an intuitive sense of what makes sense and what doesn't. So, you know, just talking to your friends or, or for my case, I talked to the uh, Center for Environmental Policies Advisory Board, you know, other professors, so on and so forth. So looking into alternative approaches also really helps. 
um, actually calculating per GDP and per capita because the most common feedback we got is, well, why don't you just control by population? And then I can show I did, and here's what it looks like. Um, knowing your variables and indicators is very helpful, obviously. Keeping good notes to remember why you did what you did. Um, and then being patient. You know, I, I often kind of chuckle myself when uh, there's news articles about, oh, this is the era of big data and everything like that. But for a lot of the data that we're trying to work with, it's not, it's not that great yet. You know, we're, we're not really, we're, we've moved quite a long ways, but we're still working with a lot of data that has a lot of quality issues, has a lot of availability issues, everything like that. So, um, you know, just being patient with that and understanding that you, you maybe have to use proxy variables or you maybe have to use a variable that doesn't report exactly what you want it to. Um, you know, these are just limitations and every project has limitations. So uh, you talk about them and you acknowledge them and, and um, you just uh, try to do the best you can with the data that's available. So that's it. I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>